our next session is um, I Want You to Want Me. So I want to bring to the stage. <laughs> and I want you to want me. Seth Solomons and Jamie Goodfriend. something that in 2017 um, we think is a very big profound shift for all of us from a marketing standpoint. All right, there we go. It's actually, thank you for telling me saying that, Seth. It's actually very simple. For all of us in this room in 2017 to succeed, we have to do more. We have to do more than just look at data, especially if we're all here at CES and we're looking at data and technology. We have to do more than just use it to sell more stuff. We have to find a way to make people feel something, to make people feel special, to feel desired. That is what love is in 2017. And it's something that we all have to pay attention to because it's a huge opportunity for us to grow our businesses. Yeah, and I think it's a, 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 a real reorientation, <laughs> as you'll see from the data. It, it's not so much about getting more people to love us, it's a little bit of a different love as we look forward. Yeah, it's definitely a different love. I mean, look, it's not about, we, we, are, we talk about customer loyalty. This is not about wringing loyalty out of people through promises and promotions. And it's not about just finding ways to do more sophisticated attribution models. I mean, those are important, but that's not the whole picture here. And it's definitely, Definitely not about interrupting people's passions. And it's not about the slides, not moving. There we go. Yeah, so, so this reorientation I talked about is um, a pretty <laughs> profound shift. Oh, look at this. We have audio. Uh, a, a pretty profound shift. Um, and we would contend that it's uh, no longer about only finding loyal customers or consumers or more aptly people but it's about building loyal brands what does it mean to be a loyal brand there's a lot of discussion about sort of mobile transforming the retail experience we talked about the importance of data but at its core we believe the world changes as brands become reoriented to being loyal to consumers and we think that this is where the change happens in terms of why people want to build an affinity or affiliation to brands going forward. And so we have an idea. We were talking about this. We've been seeing this in the data. We've been seeing this talking to our clients and the work we've been doing. And one day I said, I came into Seth's office and I said, wait, I think, I think there's a thing out there. It's this idea of wantedness. It's something that I think we can look at and we should really talk about it because we're seeing this big shift. What does it mean? What does it mean to our business? And Seth was very brave, and you agreed that this might be something we should actually, crazy that it was. Well, I actually called, I thought it was more about desirability, and I was, I was wrong. I think wantedness He said he was wrong. You guys heard it. That doesn't happen often. It's all about often. wantedness. So, you know, we decided that we should start with culture first, right? We're a data, we're, we do a lot of work with data at Wonderman, but we decided we better start with culture. So before we get into the science and the data, we decided, let's look at the Wiktionary, because isn't that where you start all studies? So we went to the Wiktionary, and guess what? The word wantedness is actually in the Wiktionary, and it said to the quality of being desired or wanted. Okay, so we said, cool, this is a thing. We got a thing. And then we decided to go further. We decided that we needed to go deep into culture. And so we talked to one of our favorite YouTube influencers, Little Esther. Does anybody know Little Esther? Stand up. Or my millennials. I know the millennials know her. She's a stand-up. She has a show on ABC called My Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. She's also a Refinery29 contributor. But she happens to be 
a world-class expert on the subject of attention. So let's hear, we did a focus group of one. It's profound. So let's hear what little Esther had to say. Wantedness means you want me so bad you cannot live without me. Okay, you need me at all costs. I just need to be wanted. I need your attention. I need you to be coming after me. I need to know that you can't exist without me. You're like a crazy boyfriend. You'll do anything to have me. And once you have me, you'll do anything to not lose me. It's like the perfect ideal relationship for someone who is totally normal and healthy. <laughs> So, <clears throat> Jamie, uh, please tell me in front of Sir Martin and both of our bosses, Mark Reed, we didn't base the study on Little Esther. Well, well, it would have been funny, though, if we did. I, well, we actually talked about, wouldn't it be great if we could take Little Esther to our client meetings? We could just go around. That would be a unique meeting. But no, we actually got very serious. And we commissioned a real research study with Penn Schoen Berlin, and we did a study in the US and the UK. We talked to 1,000 people in the US, and we talked to 1,000 people in the UK. And we talked to people 18 to 65, so we cut a broad swath of the demographics. We actually talked to quite a lot of people. So it was, it was really interesting, and we are so excited about the data. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about that, but before I get into that, one of the things that we saw in the data, which was really fascinating, this doesn't happen very often, is that the data, wait, where are the, do we have any millennials in this room? Raise your hands, where are my millennials? All right, guess what, this study's not about you, for a change. You're important, but this one's not about you, because the data was very similar across ages, it was really similar across countries, and it was similar across men and women. Same, it was, it was very similar. And so we have a bunch of really interesting data points that we're going to walk you through. So 87% of people um, are no longer comparing just industry, right? So when you think about Amazon, you think about Starbucks, Uber, companies that are transforming the world from a service standpoint, and I would argue from a, a loyal brand standpoint, are now the bar. Um, and we would argue that you need to think about operating in culture uh, versus just in category. And the orientation to um, culture, where are people experiencing the brands that they want to build affinity or affiliation with, that's where you need to start. And I think that changes most of the way we build customer experiences and we think about um, the demonstration of loyalty going forward. The next. 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 There we 89% um, want you to share their values, right? So um, we all probably are familiar with the work that Dove did around real beauty. Um, and for the first time, they put real people front and center, discussed um, what plus size real people uh, mean, and they talked about beauty in a way that was very identifiable uh, to the values of the consumers, and they won in a big way. Um, CVS. Um, lately, uh, I think late 2015, um, went public with uh, their ban on cigarettes. All right, so this is a $2 billion hit to their business and a giant gasp sort of from an investor relations standpoint. They've made back most of the $2 billion, but more importantly, they're uh, in the middle of a quantitative study that has demonstrated that um, they're almost 2% uh, of an increase in uh, public health in and around the areas uh, where CVS stores are located. So when you think about why you should build an affinity to CVS, it starts with the alignment of, of your values. And if you're a non-smoker and CVS is taking a very big business hit to do something that's right for you as a person, um, I think you're gonna see a big shift to CVS as, as they go forward. Um, almost 80% um, want you to care about them. Um, one, obviously, uh, I think many of us have heard um, was Domino's, where they basically said, look, our food is, is not good enough. Um, and we're going to re-look uh, at the way in which we make our product, the ingredients that go into it. Pretty bold statement. Um, T-Mobile, uh, very important client of ours, um, if you have uh, seen what they've done with Uncarrier, if you've listened to 
uh, John Legere, their CEO, pretty controversial, um, but he's bet everything that they should not be hindered or held back by all of the ills of what has been the telecommunications industry. And in reorienting the entire company around the consumer, around the uh, taking out all of the issues associated with uh, holding a mobile plan, being a customer, um, he's changed the company and really, you look at the Uncarrier as a moment in time for T-Mobile, but I think moving forward, um, Uncarrier ultimately becomes the strategy for T-Mobile as a company. How do they organize in totality around the needs of their consumers and ultimately become one of the premier loyal brands um, in the marketplace today? So this idea of being efficient, being friction-free. Brian was talking about the Echo. The whole idea that consumers want is they do want to buy things, but they are looking to you as brands and marketers to make their lives easier, to make things part of their daily life. I mean, if you just have to look at one thing, we all know Uber, right? Single-handedly demolished the value of a New York taxi medallion, right? Every day, people have found a new way, and it was disruptive. And it's part of being aware of what people want and then delivering it to them in, an, in a unique way, something that works for them. It's quick on the trigger finger here. OK. So we're living in this time of, I think we could call it like that it's increasing transparency, but decreasing trust, right? Everyone has their phone. I mean, you guys all have your phones in your hands right now. You can't, you can't be away from it, which means that you have access to the best of everything, 24-7, 365, which means that you are going to get the expectation, you have the expectation of having the best. Why wouldn't you? You can have the best prices, the best stories, the best products. It doesn't matter. So the idea is that consumers told us in this study that you can reorient your brand and build a different kind of relationship with people by the kind of service that you provide. And I'm not just talking about customer service, although that is actually, I came up in the data as being really key. Let's talk about two, uh, two companies that do it really well. So Sephora, they just, they just get it right every time. They have managed to integrate the physical and the digital seamlessly. This last fall, I don't know if anybody's seen it. Has anybody seen their new chatbots? They're awesome. If you want to see the best way to do a chatbot, these guys, they launched two this last fall. One is the Sephora virtual assistant, and all somebody has to do is tell the chatbot where they are, and then it will automatically tell them the most, um, like the closest beauty appointments that are available nearby, and then make that appointment for them. Talk about capturing people in the moment when they want to buy something. The other one that they just launched, which has been hugely successful for them, is on their phone they have an algorithm, and you can take a picture of, well, let's say, I could take a picture of Seth, and we could take his skin tone, and we could say he's probably a blue, and he would do really well with a certain line of Sephora products, maybe a certain dry skin type thing, or for the hair. And you would love that it. He has great dry, hair. Dry skin thing. The dry, and the hair. He's got great hair. But this is working really well for them. So they're, they're providing a new level of service because it's efficient. They also could take this algorithm, and you can take a picture of a magazine, and it will tell you how to get that look immediately and what products to buy. That's so amazing and so efficient. Another company that's really doing it well is a company called Everlane. And Everlane is a San Francisco based retailer, very tech savvy, but their whole mantra is about radical transparency. And they do. They reveal all pricing, everything to do with their supply chain where they're manufacturing, what their shipping costs are, what the cost of materials are, to the degree that last fall when cotton prices went down, they actually lowered their prices and were so transparent about it with consumers. People love them. That is the definition of a new level of service. And talk about building a relationship. Very different than just selling people. So how do we do this? How do we take all this information that Seth and I are sharing with you, and how do we put it into our regular business? How do we make this shift? The idea is that we actually do have to make a shift. We have to make some changes. So we have a wantedness playbook, and this research launched today, and I actually encourage you, if you want more information, to go to wantedness.com. That's a little bit of a pitch. Yeah. I said no. it. 
Okay. And we have more information. So the first thing that we believe that you need to do to really put this into action is get to know me. So the last panel talked about data. Super important. We have to have data. It's critical. But it's not just about gathering great data and being able to transform your business through data. It's about being relentlessly curious about what that data is telling you. It's about getting to know the people, not just the personas. Knowing who they are, not just what they are. So we work with Best Buy, and they are one of the few brands that has been acknowledged as being able to fight off Amazon. And how are they doing it? Well, one of the things that they do is, at Wonderman, we send out about, is it 9 billion emails a year for them? Roughly. And it's a process that we call rapid mass experimentation, RME. We do. We call it RME. We call it. We and I now. know that nobody talks about ras rapid mass experimentation wearing Valentino shoes, so it's okay. So we, so we like that. But rapid mass experimentation means that every minute of every day, we're using the data that we get to really get to know the consumer. Did they like this message? Did they respond to it? What product line did they respond to? And we take that information and we integrate it into the creative campaigns that we're delivering. And that is what has fueled their growth. In fact, this last, uh, they don't even call it Black Friday, what do they call it, Black November? Because they did, they had four record setting days for sales in November, four of them that were above and beyond any other results that they had ever had. And number two. Number two. There we go. Two. Um, and this goes, I think, uh, hand in hand with this notion of uh, building a loyal brand. <clears throat> Consumers want you to deliver for them at all times. How do we break down the journey? Um, how do we better understand friction points? How do we dissect through genuine curiosity what it is that's going to differentiate the brand and flip the paradigm from marketing at people to really listening harder and understanding the pressure points such that we can deliver um, above expectations, um, service and experience. If you think about the spectrum here, um, you've got obviously on the right hand side, the Amazons of the world, um, you've got the Starbucks of the world, um, but I would argue that some of the leading brands um, that people sort of aspire to are in need of a bit of a reorientation. If you think about Apple, um, everybody talks about sort of Apple and the esteem that that brand has. Apple as a marketer I think really needs to reorient, reorient itself to what consumers want from them as opposed to just sort of outsourcing the service and support of that brand. And I think that they can be more loyal to their consumers. I think if you look at a company like Nike, they certainly understand the fabric of an athlete. They're tapped into the passions of athlete. They make unbelievably uh, powerful products. But from a marketing standpoint, I would argue they're pretty antiquated in their approach. Um, a lot of marketing at, a lot of uh, websites that don't deliver longitudinal continuity, that don't acknowledge where you are in the customer journey. So you see an, an evolving spectrum of delivery um, that's going to need to change pretty quickly if those brands are going to succeed going forward. The third and final um, is uh, to keep winning me. Um, and I would argue that this is, again, a pretty big reorientation. Um, most brands that we spend a lot of time with have a campaign orientation. And that campaign orientation sort of builds to a peak, and then there's a tail. They're in the market. They're out of the market. That's how they spend money. I would argue that to be a loyal brand, to be a wanted uh, brand that delivers wantedness, um, you need a much more systematic approach. It's not about being always on but it is about being always present. One of the simple examples here, we spend a lot of time, we're pretty obsessed with looking at search data. Um, and um, if you look at the search data and you see what trends on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, you can pretty clearly understand what consumers' questions are as they make product decisions, as they try to understand better um, topic areas related to either the things that they're passionate about or issues that they have in life. Um, I would argue that that's a big component to systematically delivering the content, answering the questions, and really reorienting uh, yourself to continuing to deliver time and time again. So 
we are incredibly optimistic. We think this study is actually really good news for all of us. People actually want to buy things. You just have to find new ways to deliver that information and to deliver value in a way that is aligned with what consumers want versus what our business models have traditionally been. It's just flipping that paradigm. So if you take away anything from this last 15 minutes, other than Seth's good hair, what we want you to think about is exceeding expectations. That is the job for all of us. To win in 2017, we have to exceed expectations because that's what consumers expect. So as you go out into the real world and you have an experience where something or a brand or an opportunity makes you feel special, that makes you feel desired, remember that. And try to find a way to capture that and bring it back into what you do for your business. Because that's the key to success in 2017. Thank you.